Uh, I guess for everyone in the room, it's well known Telstra has had a very long-term relationship and engagement with Defence, and given our strong ongoing commitment to help in Defence protect our nation, its people and its interests through our extensive infrastructure and capability, we're proud to partner with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. ASPE provides a trusted, high calibre, thought leadership avenue in the defence and national security space, and of course that's of great importance to Telstra as well. As a proud sponsor of today's event, I very much uh, would like to uh, introduce you to uh, a very eminent speaker. Selected as one of the foreign policy's top 100 global thinkers, he is of course Robert D. Kaplan. Robert is uh, Chief of Geopolitical Analysts for Stratfor and a former member of the Pentagon's Defence Policy Board. Uh, in talking to uh, Robert over lunch, I think you'll find his whole engagement and uh, the subject matter that he's going to cover very, very interesting. Um, he, he really will talk to you uh, very much around uh, uh, the whole space of this, uh, the uh, world conflict zones. He, um, he's uh, come out here predominantly to go and talk uh, uh, as a keynote at the Chief of Defence Contract uh, Conference in Sydney. And, but has kindly made the trip down here to Canberra to talk to us uh, overall. Today he's going to take us around the world conflict zones according to geography, which is still the principal determinant of human affairs. So please welcome Robert D. Kaplan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honour and privilege to be here. Uh, whenever I come to Australia, I see it as the country of the future, really. I think that um, Australia's fascinating position at the confluence of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, um, its dynamic population is going to make it that the greatest decades of Australian history are in front of it, not behind it. I, I really believe that. Let me give you a, kind of a summary of, of the world in terms of the global map. And let me start with a French philosopher, Voltaire. In 1755, there was a great earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal. It destroyed the city. It killed a large percentage of the population. And Voltaire announced, as he was alive at the time, he was in his 50s, he said he was opposed to the earthquake, <laughs> that he stood opposed to it, he would not accept it. And people laughed, but like you're laughing. But Voltaire meant something very serious. What he meant was he was opposed to having human affairs determined by natural causes, that human beings should be able to rise above natural, uh, natural borders, natural constraints, whether of disease, whether of geography, whatever, that man could conquer anything. And this, is re and this was a very serious, uh, a very, a very serious um, uh, statement. And it, it, it's, it's so because today, in the early 21st century, it's one that most intellectuals subscribe to. It's ones that increasingly the global elite, what we'll call the opinion makers, the pundits, uh, you know, the top percentage of the world in terms of income, who have more in common with each other than they have with people in their own host countries often, subscribe to. They subscribe to what Voltaire meant when uh, in the sense that because of political science, international markets, the advances in medicine, uh, women's rights, humanitarian interventionism, et cetera, that humankind has conquered, has conquered the physical constraints upon it, and the world will march on from success to success. I'm here today to say no, to say wait a minute to say that, that policy, <clears throat> prudent policy, begins with the acceptance of limits. It begins with the acceptance of constraints. And that in order to overcome things like geography, you first have to be aware of how formidable it is in the first place. Voltaire could say what he did because Voltaire was a philosopher. 
he didn't have responsibility for millions of French citizens under his bureaucratic control. But people in power, people that this think tank advises, don't have that luxury. They, yeah, they, they're judged not by their intentions or not by beautiful thoughts, but by actually what they can accomplish in situations of war and peace. And if you look at it, the more you respect things like physical constraints and other constraints, the more you can deal with them, the more you can overcome them. So let me reintroduce geography, not as something completely fatalistic, because to believe in fatalism, to believe that no matter what we do, the outcome is going to be the same, no matter what General Rumsfeld appointed to run the Iraq war, the result was going to be the same, no matter what ambassador he picked, the result was going to be the same, that's lunacy because people do make differences. Policy choices really do affect outcomes. But on the other hand, to say that physical constraints have nothing to do with what we can accomplish is just as lunatic. It's just as crazy. It's like saying during the hurricane season in the United States that we're not going to look at a map of the Caribbean. We're going to look at a map of North Dakota because because uh, we, we shouldn't let geography constrain where hurricanes should go. It's like saying that it doesn't matter that Taiwan is 100 miles off the coast of mainland China, uh, that if it was 10 miles away or 20 miles away, the result would be the same. No, it wouldn't. If it was the width of the English Channel away from mainland China, Taiwan wouldn't exist today, except as a province of mainland China. Because it would have precipitated a whole different set of naval logistics that would have allowed Mao Zedong to conquer Taiwan in the 50s and late 40s. So physical space, where things are, matter. And they matter at such a deep, deep level that we overlook them and take them for granted. Um, certainly Australians would realize this as a faraway continent where air, even air travel to other places is very distant, has given Australia a measure of protection and isolation which is very valuable. It matters greatly that the United States is, um, is a virtual island nation with the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans on the east and west, with nothing but the Canadian Arctic to the north, because Canada just constitutes a thin band of civilization, middle class, maybe one-tenth the population of the U.S., all living within, um, within 100 miles of the U.S. border. America's only geographic difficulty is with Mexican demography to the south. Um, that's a much different um, geographical situation than, say, a country like Israel, a small country surrounded on three sides by en enemies with no uh, strategic depth um, for its population should it suffer even one low-grade tactical nuclear strike. So these things matter. Let me give you um, a quick tour around the world, not to show how geography <coughs> determines anything but how geography gives us a new, deeper layer of understanding in, or, in order to see news events, what we read in the newspapers, in a very different light. Uh, let's start with the Arab Spring. Let's start with the country where the Arab Spring began, in Tunisia. Tunisia happens to be the Arab country closest to Europe only an eight-mile ferry journey at a ferry traveling at only 10 or 20 miles per hour in the sea uh, to Sicily. It was more connected with Europe throughout history than any other place in the Arab world. Um, yet, in the second century BC, uh, the Roman general Scipio Africanus defeated the Carthaginians. Remember, modern Tunisia is just an outgrowth of greater Carthage. Uh, Scipio Africanus dug what he called a demarcation ditch, a fossa regia, demarcating the civilized world from the uncivilized world. And he started in Tabarka, 
on the Tunisian's northern coast with the Mediterranean, went a few hundred miles to the south, then dug the ditch eastward to Tunisia's eastern coast with the Mediterranean. Since that date, over 2,000 years ago, every place north of that ditch, within that ditch in the Mediterranean borders, uh, 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 e experienced tremendous economic growth. All the roads in Tunisia today were originally um, made by the Romans. They follow all the old Roman roads. So that that was Tunisia, that was developed t Tunisia. Now, uh, Mohamed Bouazizi, the fruit and vegetable vendor, who set himself on fire to protest underdevelopment in Tunisia, in December 2010, and thereby ignited the Arab revolt, not just in Tunisia, but throughout the Arab world, lived in a town called Sidi Bouzaid. And Sidi Bouzaid lies outside that ditch, in a part of Tunisia that always suffered underdevelopment, always suffered un unemployment. So that the Arab revolt began in, in the Arab world's most most Europeanized country, closest to the Western Enlightenment in terms of the influences that came, but in a part of that country that was comparatively underdeveloped, um, and, and underdeveloped going back not just to the Romans, but to the Vandals, the Ottoman Turks, the Byzantines, the French, etc. In other words, here's an example of how geography sheds light rather than determines what we read about in the news. Now, Tunisia, as I said, was greater Carthage. It's an age-old cluster of civilization. It has a real state identity. It has bureaucracies and institutions that actually function. Libya is a different case. Libya is just a vague geographical expression. Uh, Western Libya, Tripolitania, the um, uh, uh, synonymous with the capital of Tripoli was always throughout history oriented towards Carthage and Tunisia. Eastern Libya, Benghazi, Cyrenaica was always oriented throughout history to Egypt and Alexandria. In other words, Eastern Libya and Western Libya never had anything to do with each other up until the 20th century. Uh, almost all of Tunisia's population lives along the Mediterranean. Its deep desert stretches were, were almost never under the control of the central government. So when Tunisia's government fell apart, and when Libya's government fell apart, you had two completely different results. In Tunisia, you had a political challenge of how the various parties could get together to agree on ruling the country. But the country still existed. Institutions still functioned. Police forces in the army still worked. There was no chaos. Yes, the crime rate has gone up, but essentially it's still ruled. It's still a place that is ruled. Libya is a different story. Libya, which had no history of central government for thousands of years, um, when, the central, when, the, when the dictator collapsed, um, the, the new government that was eventually elected has no power beyond Greater Tripoli. Um, the reason the U.S. Embassy was attacked by Al-Qaeda was because there were Al-Qaeda training centers outside Benghazi. The reason that there were Al-Qaeda training centers outside Benghazi was because Libya is not a country. Um, the central government could not, you know, as writ did not control anywhere outside of the capital city um, in that sense. Egypt is like Tunisia, age-old cluster of civilization. The Nile flows no south to north, but the winds blow north to south, enabling sailing in both directions. Um, the, uh, Libya is, uh, Egypt is protected from invasion by the Mediterranean because of the Nile Delta, protected from invasion on the east and west because of the desert. The times Egypt was invaded throughout history are so rare as to be remembered by us, like Napoleon's invasion and the Hyksos invasion. So Egypt, like Libya, could develop as a real country with institutions and bureaucracy. Like Tunisia, Libya, uh, Egypt's problems are political. How can, a, 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 how can an Islamic government control more extreme Islamics, I, I, Islamists in order to maintain a peace treaty with Israel, relations with the West, etc.? But the issue of governance, 
only exists in Tunisia, in, in Libya, because it was never a real country because of its desert geography. Same with Yemen. Yemen is true an age-old cluster of civilization, but of not one civilization, but of six or seven kingdoms throughout history, because it is so infernally divided by mountains and deserts. Uh, Himalayan, uh, Hadramuti, Sabian, other kingdoms all existed at the same time in, in Yemen. Uh, the Western media has loved to attack the uh, former dictator of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, uh, this horrible dictator. Um, I have a different opinion. I think that Ali Abdullah Saleh was one of the most impressive leaders in the Middle East over the last third of a century. Ali Abdullah Saleh obtained power in Yemen in 1978. The previous rulers of Yemen, going back three of them, were either assassinated or left office within a year. Uh, Yemen was divided between north-south, uh, between northern Yemen and a communist South Yemen. Ali Abdullah Saleh united the two Yemens. He kept power for 30 years. He wasn't assassinated. He was actually able to control this infernally divided geographical country and control uh, about 60 or 70 percent of it at ever, any one time. Yemen will not see his like again. Yemen is now a completely divided country. And you, the way you tell how if a country is ruled and to what extent it is ruled is not by reading the newspapers but by driving around it and seeing if it's physically safe to drive around. Uh, Yemen is not safe. Different armed gangs and militias control different parts. Again, we go back to geography. Syria, let me take Syria. Syria is a, a, is a, a potential Yugos, former Yugoslavia in the making. Libya, uh, Syria is an Ottoman era geographical expression with Alawites in the northwest, Sunnis in the central corridor, Kurds in the northeast, Druze in the southern mountains, other ethnic groups, all related to a specific region of the country. Uh, Syria was if you remember during the Cold War era and the years in the decade and a half after the Cold War, that Syria was the most, anti, the most hostile anti-Israel country in the Arab world. It, was, it called itself the throbbing heart of Arabism. The reason it did that was Syria had so many internal sectarian and ethnic divisions that the only way it could assuage those divisions was to, was to appeal to a pan-Arab identity outside of those divisions and beyond them. So it was precisely because Syria was so, so internally divided that it was the most radical rejectionist of the Arab countries. Um, I don't know which direction Syria is going now. As we speak, it is becoming a, 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 a larger version of, Yemen, of, of Lebanon in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so, so that's the Middle East for you. Uh, the Arab Spring started as a defeat of geography through, set, through social media and technology, where demonstrators in one part of the Arab world could uh, could inspire demonstrators in another part of the Arab world. But as the Arab Spring sunk in and revolts started around the Arab world from Morocco to Oman, um, knowing geography adds a deeper insight to e what was going on in each individual country and allows one to be less surprised by what will happen in each individual country. Um, let me go on to Europe. We tend to think of Europe as just a financial story, a very complex economic story of debt ratios, of, of interest rates, of loans, etc. That's not true. Europe is coming back into the news as a geopolitical story. Um, there isn't one Europe, there are several Europes. There, um, if you look at the European Union, what are its main cities? Brussels, Den ha The Hague, Strasbourg, Maastricht. These this was the old spinal route of Charlemagne's empire in the ninth century. This was Carolinian Europe, as they used to call it in the early Middle Ages. 
And so it's no wonder that this was the root of the European Union, because this was the part of Europe that was closest to the Atlantic, that was open to trade routes, yet was protected by the ocean from a barrier of islands over the low countries, had rich, lost soil which allowed for free agriculture, which enabled the development of free societies in a higher technological era of movable type. But then you also had Central Europe, Habsburg and Prussian Europe, it closer, closer to Eastern Europe in the heart of in, in the heart of the continent, where you had, you had constant pressure coming from what was then the various czarist kingdoms, etc. This was somewhat less prosperous. Then, of course, you had the Mediterranean with its, with its poor stony soils that required irrigation and large holdings that were more friendly to autocratic societies and a slower level of development. <laughs> And then you had the Balkans. Uh, the Balkans, rather than controlled for centuries by the Habsburgs and Prussians, generally fell under Ottoman Turkish rule, which was a weaker, which was institutionally weaker, bureaucratically weaker, and economically weaker. And though, uh, so the Balkans included Romania, Bulgaria, the former Yugoslavia, and Greece. So it is no accident that Greece, which is in the southeast corner of Europe, where the Mediterranean and Balkan and Turkish and Byzantine worlds overlap, just happened to be the most economically troubled of the European Union countries. Geography had something to do with it. 75% of Greek businesses are family owned, where meritocracy doesn't matter, because only the family members are promoted. Um, this is not just the mistake of this finance minister or that finance minister. This has a lot to do with the legacies of history and culture and the fact that Greece is the child of Byzantine and Turkish despotism. What the EU is, the, the EU, the Euro, is a very ambitious project because it seeks to unite a vast array of countries that because of geography had vastly different development patterns. Um, this doesn't mean it can't be overcome. It means that it's a great struggle. If you were to look at the map of Europe at the time the Berlin Wall collapsed in 1989, and according to the map, you could have predicted how the former countries of the Warsaw Pact would all do economically, socially, and politically over the next 15 years. Poland and the western part of what was then Czechoslovakia would do the best in the north. Hungary would do a little bit to the south, slightly worse, but still very good. Romania would be a disaster, a desolate disaster. Bulgaria and Albania would fall into semi-chaos, and Yugoslavia would have a war. Uh, the last few countries I mentioned all fell in the Turkish Ottoman sphere. So that, you know, the map alone could have told you how these countries were to do um, economically. Uh, let, me, let me talk about Russia for a minute. Um, oh, and w one more word about Europe. The southern border of Europe is not the Mediterranean. It's the Sahara Desert. Because all the North African Arab countries, when you look at a demographic map, everyone lives near the sea. There are very few people in the desert. So what the Arab Spring really shows us is that gradually these dictatorships have fallen. The, uh, you will have, Europe will not only, has already expanded to the east because of the end of the Cold War. Now it will expand to the south. It will become bigger but more unwieldy and more chaotic at the same time. And the great geographical struggle in Europe will be the one that it was in previous centuries, that of Russia versus Central Europe. Uh, uh, the, the Warsaw Pact may have collapsed, but geography is still relevant because Russia still happens to, ex to lie just to the east of Eastern Europe. Um, in the West, in, at least in my country, uh, the media has demonized Vladimir Putin. He's, he's corrupt. He's mafioso. He rides horses without a shirt on. Um, 
He rides a motorcycle with leather jacket. He represents all that's evil and bad in Russia. I've got news for you. Vladimir Putin is just a typical average Russian autocrat very, with very similar beliefs as the czars and commissars before him because he operates from the same geographical compass point. Um, the West wants an enlightened Western Democrat to rule Russia. I'm sorry, only a Russian will rule Russia. Um, and the Russian is going to look at Europe and see not just have the French and the Germans invaded us over history, but so have the Swedes and the Lithuanians and the Poles. And therefore, Russia, as Putin rightly says, will demand buffer zones in Eastern Europe. So Putin will tra is trying to undermine Poland, the Baltic states, Romania, in every way he can, through crime groups, uh, through buying up banks and infrastructure, uh, through fixing, uh, help, trying to fix elections, whatever it takes. Um, because from a Russian point of view, the collapse of the Soviet Union robbed Russia of buffer zones it needed. So he, he, he orchestrates a limited invasion of Georgia. He tries, to, you know, he tries to involve himself in Central Asia because he has a problem. Russia constitutes half the longitudes of the world, of the earth, and yet its population is smaller than that of Bangladesh. Its population is getting even smaller, and it has no natural boundaries. So any Russian leader will be hostile to the West in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. Um, and any Russian leader will publicly profess friendship with China as a superficial uh, pan-authoritarian alliance against the West, but will privately be deeply suspicious of everything China does. Um, so, so essentially, Europe, uh, we're back to um, a 19th century Europe, geography tells us. Um, Russia will compete with Germany over the Baltic states and Poland. Uh, Russia will, um, um, you know, uh, Russia and Turkey both will compete for influence in the Balkans, even as the EU's influence wanes. The EU no longer has the economic bandwidth to win over and entice countries from Serbia to the Ukraine. Turkey's economy has been growing by leaps and bounds for, for about a decade now. So the Balkans are like they were in the 19th century, an intermediary zone between Turkish, European, and Russian influence. This is a far cry from the 1990s. Uh, because we had forgotten geography. Let me turn to this part of the world, to China, uh, to China and Asia. Um, China, to me, has a geographical advantage and a geographical dilemma. Its geographical advantage is this. Just outside of China's borders, in the Russian Far East, in former Soviet Central Asia, in Southeast Asia, China sees advantages, it sees opportunities. There may be 100 million people in Manchuria, but on the Russian side of the border, north and east of the Amur and Osuria rivers, there's only 7 million Russians. And that number is going down to about 5 million over the next, uh, the next two decades. Also, that part of the Russian Far East is very rich in timber, diamonds, gold, all of which Chinese companies deeply covet. China had that area, but had but ceded it during a time of Chinese weakness in the 1860s. Uh, China won't take it back in a, in a military fashion, but China, but China's people, its corporations, will increasingly have influence up there. In <clears throat> in Central Asia, China is carving out an inadvertent new empire. Uh, China's built. Um, oil and natural gas pipelines from Kazakhstan and, and Turkmenistan into western China. Uh, China. Chinese goods flood the markets of Central Asia. China is building railroads throughout former Soviet Central Asia. This again is why Putin can never really trust China. Um, the Americans want to leave Afghanistan. The Chinese want to stay and come in. 
because Afghanistan has large deposits of copper and other strategic minerals and metals that China wants. And China is willing to take risks. Um, when the Americans leave Afghanistan, uh, what you're likely to see over the next decade or so is, um, is a, a reinvention of the Tang Dynasty from the ninth century, where Chinese influence stretched as far as northeastern Iran. Um, in Southeast Asia, we can no longer take Thailand's stability and robust, and, and robust economy for granted. A weakened Thai state uh, further allows Ch uh, uh, China to divide and conquer throughout Southeast Asia. Those are the advantages China has, but it also has disadvantages because the ethnic Han core of China is central China and the Pacific coast. Within China itself, whether it's the Inner Mongolian Plateau, the Western Xinjiang province, or the vast Tibetan Plateau, is where minorities live, Inner Mongolians, Uyghur, Turkic Muslims, or Tibetans, um, who dislike the Chinese immensely in all cases. These upland minority regions is also where most of the water for China is, it's where 80% of the coal deposits are, and many other natural resources are. So while China sees itself projecting outward, beyond its borders, it's also very insecure and claustrophobic within its borders. Because any quasi-democratic or liberal opening in China has to mean more minority unrest. Because the opening will not just be for individual and human rights, it will be for ethnic minority rights as well. You can't separate the two. So far, over the last few decades, China's, board, China's land situation, its situation on its borders, have been fair, secure, in fact, more secure than over the last 200 years since the high point of the Qing dynasty. And because China was so secure on land, it has had the luxury to go to sea in the manner that it has. China's building of a great navy, its pressing of claims in the South and East China Sea, ultimately goes back to China's favorable position on land um, compared to previous times in modern Chinese history. Were China's internal situation ever to weaken or to become more unstable, whether with its land borders, whether in its minority areas, it would undermine China's projection of power at sea. I think in all the discussion about China, we tend to think in a linear fashion that the last 30 years of authoritarian rule in China, in other words, the post-Mao authoritarian rule, is going to tell us what the next 30 years are going to be like. That may not be the case. You could have a weakened China on one hand, where more unrest, more political instability, that would lead to a more aggressive and truculent China on the other hand, because, if, because if, if you get a weakening of the authoritarian system, it's possible that the military would create, would create a, a more of a power, a, a power apparatus in its own right, less susceptible to civilian rule, and that could endanger, endanger stability in the Western Pacific. Um, I think the Western Pacific has been... Um, We've taken its stability for granted for too long. It's been dependent on benign, stable authoritarian rule in China, on a stable North Korea, on a quasi-pacifistic Japan. Um, I think that's all changing. It's changing slowly and gradually so it doesn't make the news. But I think when you look ahead for the next 20 or 30 years, you at least have to envision a more unstable China, a more aggressive Chinese military, a Japan with a more normal relationship to its military than in its, its quasi-pacifistic post-World War II past. And the fact that in the Korean Peninsula, if you look at divided country scenarios of the 20th century, 
North and South Yemen, North and South Vietnam, East and West Germany, despite all the expert predictions, those divisions collapsed within a period of weeks in a very tumultuous manner without any, without any notice ahead of time. Therefore, I'd be very wary about predicting a continued future of a, of a stable, divided um, Korean peninsula. Um, let me just move on and say a few words about, about Iran. Um, Iran and then the United States. If you were to ask, uh, uh, fact, all right, I'll, I'll say this. Ten, in 10 years ahead, I would not be surprised if the United States and the West in general had a closer relationship with Tehran than it has with Riyadh at the moment. Because while Iran may have a revolutionary regime, the Iranian state is synonymous with the Iranian plateau. The Saudi state is not synonymous with the, Ara with the Arabian Peninsula. What does that mean? Uh, there have been Iranian states since Middle Antiquity, since the Achaemenids, the Sassanids, the Parthians, the Medes, right up to the Qajars and the Ayatollahs, the Pahlavis and the Ayatollahs. Um, Iran may suffer upheaval. It may have a civil war. Its regime may collapse. Its regime may transform. It may have an economic collapse because of the sanctions. But there will always be an Iranian state. Uh, which is synonymous with the Persian language. Um, Iran, Persian influence, linguistic il, il, influence stretches from the Mediterranean all the way to Bangladesh. Uh, remember, Persian was the official language of India right up through 1835. There are many, many Persian loan, uh, loan words in Hindi and Bengali, in Pashtun, in Urdu, etc. Per, Iran constitutes a great civilization. And it's, it, it's an Indo-European civilization. If you go to Tehran, you'll see church steeples. You'll see women with garish makeup driving uh, motorcycles. You won't find that in Saudi Arabia. You won't find that at all. S uh, the Arabian Peninsula also includes Oman, Yemen, the Gulf states, vast areas. The, whereas Iran is a state because of the Iranian plateau, Saudi Arabia is a state because of a family. And the family is increasingly weakening. It's going from stable rule under seven brothers, the Suderi seven, to rule by hundreds of grandchildren and nephews and uncles with more and more divisions internally. Uh, with, an under, with an underground water table that's rapidly diminishing, with a population growth that's out of control, with up to 40% male youth unemployment, I would not want to be a Saudi ruler today. Because looking ahead to geography, to other things, a Saudi ruler has to contemplate the fact that the United States has been estranged from Iran for a third of a century. That's a decade longer than it was estranged from quote unquote red China. Um, this estrangement cannot last forever. At some point, the United States and Iran will have a strategic dialogue. And when that happens, what then happens to US-Saudi relations? This is the real big question of the Middle East in, in geostrategic terms that overarcs the questions of whether or not Iran will get a nuclear weapon, whether or not Israel will attack Iran, et cetera. Um, finally, the United States. Why is the United States a great power? I would say because the United States became the dominant power in the Caribbean in the late 19th century. The New World, geographically, is not divided between North and South America. It's divided between the area north of the Amazonian jungle and south of the Amazonian jungle. It's the Amazon that basin that is the real dividing point, much harder to cross than crossing the Caribbean. The Caribbean is sort of the American Mediterranean. It's the center of strategic life in the New World. 
The Caribbean includes not just the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf states of the US and all the islands, it includes northern South America. Because Colombia, Venezuela, the Guyanas, all their populations live north on the Caribbean. Um, by coming to dominate the greater Caribbean, the United States came to dominate the Western Hemisphere. So it, with domination of an entire hemisphere, it then had power to spare to affect the balance of power in the Eastern Hemisphere. And that's what made 20th century history, the ability of the United States to affect the outcomes of two world wars and the Cold War. Um, China looks at the South China Sea and East China Seas the way the United States looked at the Caribbean. It's the, the South China Sea especially is a marginal sea like the Caribbean. It's semi-enclosed, open to oceans. The South China Sea is the connector between the Muslim Indian Ocean world and the Confucian Western Pacific world. It's where most of the world's cargo traffic goes through. Um, it carries 60, 80 percent of the energy needed for coastal China, Japan, and South Korea. It's arguably the most strategic uh, bit of maritime uh, um, ge uh, geography in the world. And with, with domination of the South China Sea, China becomes a two ocean power, um, the, the, Indian, uh, the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, China. It's interesting. When I was in Beijing a few months ago, and I gave this talk, this very talk, a Chinese student said to me, by dominating the Caribbean, we're just bringing peace and harmony to Asia. Whereas the United States uh, warships in the, in the in, I mean, dominating the South China Sea, we're just bringing peace and harmony to Asia. But when US warships come to the South China Sea, that's hegemony. Because that's its hegemony because the US warships have traveled from half a world away, while the South China Sea is our sea. It's, you know, we dominate it. Um, so what if the law of the sea treaty gives, uh, gives rights to Vietnam and Malaysia and the Philippines? Our claims go back much further than some 1982 UN convention. So this is where we are, I think. At the, or at, in the second decade of the 21st century, where um, we're in a world that's more interrelated, more claustrophobic, where every place is strategic because every place affects every other place as never before because of, geo because of uh, technology. Technology has not defeated geography. It's just made it more interrelated and more, and, and, and more, uh, and more precious at the same time. So that what happens in the South China Sea affects the Indian Ocean. We can talk now of a, of a rimland Indo-Pacific world stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Sea of Japan. Um, and in the midst of all this, at the midst of, geo of technology making geography more unstable, more claustrophobic, more precious, Australia is less of an island, less of, a, of an isolated continent than it's ever been before. Thank you very much. Well, Robert, thank you. That was uh, a fascinating uh, tour de force, and uh, I must say, done with uh, done with almost no notes as well. Very, uh, very impressive. I had notes. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, looking at the time, uh, what I propose is that we take uh, Q&A for about uh, 10 minutes now, uh, which will then give Robert the, the opportunity for some dessert and also to, uh, to go to, uh, to the airport. Um, and so uh, I'm uh, very happy to take some uh, questions from the floor. And I'll go to uh, Bill Maley. Bill Maley from the Australian National University. Yeah. Uh, I was very interested in your comments about China's uh, involvement uh, in Afghanistan, where I've just been with Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, six weeks ago, we saw the most senior Chinese visitor to Afghanistan since Liu Xiaoqi in 1966. Um, huh. yeah. I, I wonder how you see this as playing out in terms of the relationship between 
China and Pakistan because two options seem to present themselves at the moment. One would be that China would, as it were, sublet to its long-term associate Pakistan uh, responsibility for security in Afghanistan for China's economic interest, which could presage a kind of boosting of uh, push by the Taliban to take over much of the country. The other would be Chinese pressure on Pakistan to discontinue its involvement with that kind of actor on the grounds that it wouldn't guarantee long-term security of China's economic interests in Afghanistan and could potentially have an effective um, impact on Xinjiang as well. And, uh, I'd just be interested to know yeah. how you would see China's uh, approach possibly playing out. China, Russia, Pakistan, India, all are aware that the United States is going to be leaving Afghanistan. Um, we don't know the results of the election on Tuesday, but if President Obama is reelected, I think he's going to withdraw almost all troops in 2013. He's not even going to wait to 2014. Uh, if Governor Romney is elected, his options are going to be very limited. He's not going to want to tr keep troops there indefinitely. Though the U.S. may play around and keep five, ten thousand 10,000 special operations forces in the country, they're not going to have much of a political role at all. So like when the, there came a point in the Iraq war when the U.S. became irrelevant, even though it still had troops on the ground there. It became politically irrelevant. I think we're reaching that point in Afghanistan now. And I think that from everything I can understand, the Taliban now have calculators which show them just how much money they stand to gain if they can make a deal on these mineral deposits and all. And all. With, you know, their new calculators have enough zeros on them to, uh, um, to show them. I, I don't believe Afghanistan's going to fall into chaos. I think there's going to be some kind of a deal that's going to be dependent on divvying up these vast profits, mineral pro uh, profits, that's going to allow um, uh, Pakistan, Pakistan requires a friendly Afghanistan, a, what's call, what I would call a non-pro-Indian Afghanistan. Uh, it can get that with some sort of coalition government with the Taliban in, in power. That's good for China, too, because China doesn't care who rules Afghanistan, as long as it's safe and stable so it can exploit minerals in the area. Um, the Indians, of course, are concerned, terrified, in fact, of a pro-Pakistani Afghanistan. I believe that the Indians um, are going to be moving closer to the Russians um, because they're gonna, the Indians are going to see that the U.S. can't do anything for them in Afghanistan, that the U.S. can do a lot for them in the Indian Ocean and other spheres and in Burma and other places, but not in Afghanistan. And so what you might see is more cooperation between Russia and India and more cooperation between China and, and Pakistan over Afghanistan. Um, and the, I think there's a 50-50 chance that Afghanistan is not going to fall into chaos, you know, it's not, that it's going to be semi-governable and that there's going to be roads built, there's going to be tremendous exploitation of strategic minerals and metals. Um, in the country. It's going to force all of these countries, Russia, China, Pakistan, India, to, de to, to, to deal with each other. Now we have a question from uh, Bob Lowry. Um, as, as a Tasmanian, I'm rather disappointed that uh, you didn't cover Tasmania, but you've done a fair job. Really <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but on a more serious note, you, you mentioned that you, know, you saw, saw China dominating the South China Sea. It's a pretty terrible name, I suppose. And that giving it access to two oceans and being able to secure its side from the Middle East, etc. But that assumes that it's dominating the Indonesian archipelago as well. Is that, is that how you see it? Um, China does not need to dominate Indonesia per se. It, 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 first of all, it's incapable of doing so. It's, a, it's, 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 it's questionable whether the Indonesian government can dominate the Indonesian archipelago. Um, China just needs to be able to um, uh, 
to, to have fair degree of domination of the seas near Indonesia. That's all it needs. But I don't see this happening because I see the U.S. is pushing back, at least in the near term, on this. That Vietnam is, the, the U.S. does not, he, here's the, the situation for the U.S. The U.S. needs to, will try to prevent China from dominating the South China Sea. But it also should not and cannot let countries like Vietnam and the Philippines force the U.S. into a conflict with China at the same time. Because the Vietnamese will be anti-Chinese whatever the U.S. does. Uh, the U.S. gets Vietnam's anti-Chinese posture for free, so to speak. Um, I, I, I think, I, so I think that China will over time hope and plan that the U.S. Navy will little by little get smaller, that the U.S. will cede influence in the Western Pacific to China so that there's a balance of power between the navies rather than U.S. unipolar naval domination as presently still exists. Um, but, but nobody needs to dominate what goes on on land in Indonesia. The question is, can the Indonesians patrol their own waters? And that's very questionable because their navy is almost nothing to speak of. Does the revenge of geography mean a more um, militarized and expansionist Germany and Japan, a return to their 20th century patterns? I think that Germany will become a more normal country. It's had decades of quasi-pacifism. Um, it's, it's, it's tried to, uh, to avoid getting involved in great power politics. But here's Germany's dilemma. Germany's policy for decades was to let itself be swallowed up within Europe, to become, to become Europeanized. But now Ger Berlin looks around and sees the European Union melting away in many ways. So it can't depend on Europe anymore. Meanwhile, if it can't depend on Europe, the last thing Germany needs is a conflict with Russia. So in inevitably, um, a weakening EU means Germany moving closer to Russia in the short run. But it's unclear that this can last for the middle and long term. At some point, Germany needs to become a normal nation in terms of its attitude towards the use of military force. Because Poland and the Baltic states will become venues for German-Russian uh, competition. What I find fascinating is that there's more and more military cooperation between the Nordic countries. It's the, in other words, Sweden, Finland, Norway, and Denmark are seeing NATO weakening. They're seeing the EU weakening. And they're worried about Russia. So what are they doing? They're buying up banks in the Baltic states. They're, moving, they're having a bigger presence in the Baltics. They're signing agreements left and right with each other for military cooperation. There's a, a real Nordic battle group that's coming into being that's, that's not just in name but, it, but in fact. That's what I mean when I say we're seeing the division of Europe into geographical blocks. You have the Visegrad group, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia coming together as a military bloc, separating themselves from the, from the Balkans. So Germany has no choice but to re-enter power politics after escaping from it for, for decades. I think the same goes tr holds true for Japan. Uh, Japan lived for decades under the complete embrace and protection of the U.S. Navy and Air Force. Um, it, it lived with a Korean peninsula that may have been divided but was stable with a China that for decades was so busy building its economy from the devastation of Mao's policies that its military might have been growing dramatically, but it started from such a low end, it didn't really matter. But now China's military might is becoming full grown. The Korean Peninsula's stability cannot be taken for granted. And it's unclear 
uh, where, how big the U.S. military presence, you know, naval and air presence will be in Asia, say, 20 years into the future. So Japan and Germany are rearming. Uh, they're becoming, I wouldn't call them aggressive states, but normal states, because in the post war, post World War II decades, they were not normal states. They were quasi pacifistic states. We've got one last question coming from over here. John Lexman. Uh, Robert, thank you very much for a fascinating uh, survey of global strategic affairs. Um, you raised the point about China and the South China Sea, or um, depending on who you, you ask, what it's called, the Western Philippine Sea or oh. whoever else. <laughs> um, but it, it does That's what the new maps in Manila call it, <laughs> yeah, the right. Western Philippine Sea. Yeah, no, yeah. that's great. But uh, perception is reality, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's interesting. I'm just wondering if you could put yourself in our shoes and think about where we stand and where we should go. If uh, the South China Sea is really the South China Sea, and that's the inevitable uh, projection, uh, if that is the case, what should Australia do? Should we be more circumspect in our relationship with uh, China and the United States? Where does it place us? If you were in our shoes, what would you do? Uh, all right, Australia constitutes a vast continent, but it has a very small population. For only 22 million people clustered in a few parts of that continent. What this means in geographical terms is that it's good for Australia to be allied with the world's great maritime power, which in decades past has conveniently been an Anglo-Saxon power, the United States. Um, for decades, and this is where I'm channeling U. White's thesis, the, uh, Australia had few difficult decisions to make. It could grow its economy dramatically because China was growing dramatically and there was trade between the two countries. So the growth of China, the rise of China was good for Australia. At the same time, American unipolar power in the Pacific was also good for Australia. So there were few, uh, there were relatively few um, uh, <clears throat> strategic decisions to make, but the world is becoming more complicated. China's power is, become, is coming to a point where China may not challenge the U.S. in the Western Pacific, but at some point may, may, may demand pa a parity of sorts. And I think what this means for Australia is, number one, Australia has to spend more on its own defense, which, which it's already doing, um, that Australia has to maintain a close alliance with the U.S., but at the same time, must police that alliance so that it never comes into serious <coughs> conflict with China. And that if it sees any American administration becoming too hawkish with China, vis-a-vis -vis China, it needs to counsel Washington against that for Australia's own national interest. What a great place to finish, and I should make it clear that I didn't pay Robert to say any of those uh, yeah, yeah. remarks about defence spending. Uh, Rob, Robert, it's been a, uh, a fascinating uh, uh, 45 minutes or so. I, I, uh, I think uh, there's an awful lot to be said for uh, how you uh, describe in your latest book the, uh, the importance of um, stepping back from global travel to actually think a little bit about uh, you know, the underlying uh, geographic drivers of so much of the world's contemporary strategic problems. I think, frankly, the, the problem we have is a very unpromising combination of 21st century geography but 19th century nationalism, which uh, seems to me to be one of the defining yeah. features emerging mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Asia Pacific at the moment. Yeah. But uh, look, it really has been a fascinating talk. Uh, Thank you so much for My uh, coming and speaking to us. And would you please thank uh, Robert Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.